Okay, lecture number four. Lecture number four. So let me put the recording on just uh, just to have a backup system if something goes wrong in my stream, which I doubt, which I seriously doubt. Okay, today one of it's going to be one of those big days, one of those memorable days, like. You know, in your life, there are certain uh, milestones like uh, graduating from high school, getting master degree, getting married, getting a child, learning how to conduct the kinematic analysis, uh, retiring, so on and so forth. So this goes the same level. So this is like uh, almost like uh, pretty much like before and after kind of experience. And uh, like I say, this this experience you're gonna learn or you're gonna you're gonna have today is uh, conducting a kinematic analysis. This is like mind blowing experience. Like, oh, really? Can I can I really do this? And yet, yes, you can. Yes, you can. So uh, that's what we're gonna do today, and this is gonna be the main body of today's lecture. And uh, we do have uh, two numerical examples, which I uh, uh, which. Uh, Hopefully sets the light to you know what's what's up with the whole deal of uh, kinematic analysis. But prior to jumping that, there's uh, there are a few things that I would like to share with you. Uh, first of all, I would like to give a summary bigger and more extensive than usually. This time I want to give you like big picture like what is that we have learned so far. And I have a fly in my office. Like how how come? Okay. And also now the one practical matter, and the practical matter is related to this uh, uh, Temeco website. And I don't know if you guys know it, but if you log into Core's Moodle site, it uh, provides any instructions how that you can actually start uh, doing that uh, Temeco website. And let me share that with you. So uh, there, no, not yet visible yet. So this is um, Core's. Let me uh, do the minor setting here. Okay, this is a core Moodle site. And now we're here in a period number one. No, excuse me, period number one, but don't take that. Select this uh, general. I think it, for me, is to put it in a writing and fit it. But for you, I think that it is, uh, well, whatever language you prefer. So anyways, uh, select that general, and then there are announcement, a lecture, and notes, and so on and so forth. And down here, there's a, uh, uh, oh, by the way, there's Socrates results, and there is, should be available also the weekly homework results, which I don't see it right now, but it should be there, should be there. But these are the instructions how to do and how to take this demo for your use. And some additional instructions and like that. So, as promised, this demo will be an alternative way to get this extra 0 0.25 points. So uh, if you wanted to get a, if you want to score high in this course, I recommend you to do these uh, additional or supplementary tasks. And additional tasks are, first of all, these in-class quizzes that you can participate by, by having or following my stream. There's only available in stream, doing the weekly homework, or then you can do this uh, Temeco. A website. So those are the three choices how you can get this uh, extra 0.25 points. And as promised on Monday, because Monday there was this uh, introduction lecture to mechanical engineering or master level studies in mechanical engineering. I'm not really sure what, what is exactly the title of the course. But in the lecture on Monday, I promise that if you are capable to, to beat me in a, one of the exercises, which we select to be a chin-up competition, Chin up means that there's a bar and you need to take yourself up all the way that uh, to your chin will go up to the bar. If you beat me in that competition, I will give you one extra point to in class quizzes or demeco. So just one extra point, but still worth it try, worth to give a shot. Which will be the hardest point if you're capable to get that. But anyways, challenge is set. And with that, let's move on to summary. And like promised, this time I would like to provide you a summary that is a bit more extensive than usually. So let's take a look at what is that we have learned so far. We have learned this so far. We'll learn 
Now, the multi-body system dynamics is a system that consists of multiple bodies. Well, that's what the title implies. Multiple bodies means that there have to be one or more moving bodies, moving bodies, bodies that are capable to move. So uh, let's uh, provide like um, a topological uh, representation of uh, this multi-body system. So it's a system that consists of, uh, uh, oh, I can see that there are comments related to this chin of competition. So how many we are talking? So we are talking about many. I can guarantee you that. I can guarantee you that. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, so there's a comment that's still waiting. Okay, I'm not sure like what is what is that you guy waiting. Uh, <laughs> okay, and there's some more comments about uh, and then Temex comment comment about Temeco enrollment. Why did he asking a phone number and address? That I don't know. Really don't know that. I'm sorry that I don't know all the details related to this Temeco side. Okay, back to multibody. And now I see that there is something. Now I see that, now I understand, finally I understand that uh, why these settings, uh, I still need to make a minor setting change to my my screen here. So I need to put this a bit bigger. And then I, go, I need to go back to my OBS. Just a second, I will be with you momentarily. And now you're talking, now it looks better. Still there is a solder, so my green screen is not perfect today. And I think that's partly due to the fact that my camera that I'm using is not that huge high-end camera, but it's one of those affordable ones. So I guess that, that that's the reason that there is that shadow. Anyway, so I was about to explain the multibody. So multibody system is a system that consists of uh, multiple bodies. Here's an example of multi-body schematic representation. That was the word that I was looking previously, not topological, but schematic representation. So there's a body A, B, and C, so three bodies. And each of these bodies are described by generalized coordinates. These generalized coordinates are telling you how is a body A, or how is a configuration of body A? How much it is translated off from the origin of a global coordinate system and how much it is rotated, how much it is rotated. Each one of these three bodies, they need three generalized coordinates to explain how is their configuration. That's how it goes. So, you know, remember this song which says that everybody needs love. That's technically incorrect because everybody actually needs three generalized coordinates instead of love. So, uh, Take, keep that in your mind. So technically, you need three generalized coordinates in planetary case. In spatial case, you need uh, six or seven, depending what kind of rotational parameters you select to use. So, but let's stay in a planetary case. So everybody needs three generalized coordinates. All right. And these are telling you exactly how is a body configuration, how much it is translated, how much it is rotated at any given time. So these generalized coordinates can change their numerical values depending on how is a body configuration, where that it is located and how much it is rotated at, all right? Now, these are the bodies, so three bodies, and these three bodies are connected together when you have joints, mechanical joints, which mathematically are expressed by constraints. Constraints that are function of generalized coordinates these guys. And what is these uh, constraints are doing for you? They are relating these generalized coordinates together. That means that in practice, they are limiting the motion possibilities between the neighboring bodies. So example is this, you know, you have a beam-like body. Beam-like body can translate to global X and Y direction and it can rotate. So let's put the rotation like theta here. But if I could introduce the constraint, which says that, okay, actually this one end of the beam like body have to be connected to ground via revolute joint, that means that there is only one way that this system can move after this introduction of a joint. So this is a good example how they are limiting the motion possibilities. Okay, 
Now, here comes the next lesson then. Each body, A, B, and C, they actually consist of infinite number of particles. And the dynamics is all about the particles. So we are describing the particles location with respect to global coordinate system. How we do that? We do that with this equation that we are very much familiar with. So we have here first translation of the body reference coordinate system, then rotation of the body coordinate system and vector u bar. And generalized coordinates and this kinematic description we're using are heavily engaged. So they are, you know, depending on each other. And in this time, because we're selecting to use this uh, kinematic uh, representation, that means that the variables that are describing the configuration of a uh, one body are these three ones, Rx, Ry, and angle theta. That's it. I don't need, now I need to um, take a look at the, about the comment. So there is a comment that is uh, 30 chin-ups enough. Uh, no comments. I want to keep this as my, I mean, that I, I do know how much I can do, but I want to keep it as my private information because I would like you two guys to be surprised. So I don't tell that to you. But uh, 30 is a good number. Let, let me just uh, tell you that much. Uh, and, uh, then, no, no, we are not going to put you to any of the gangs or anything, If even if you provide some uh, contact information regarding or, or when you are signing in this Temeco, Temeco site. Okay, yeah, and then, uh, you know, there is uh, one guy that says that he's uh, very good in chin-ups. Yeah, but I'm, I'm good too. So we'll see. So challenge is, is here. Okay, uh, now this is the big picture of multi-body system dynamics. All right, so let me, uh, let me back up a little bit and let's look at what we discussed last week. So last week we discussed shortly about the redundant constraint, meaning that the constraints, joints if you want, are said to be such that they are no longer independent from each other, but they are eliminating the same motion possibilities. And that's why they become to be redundant. Door is an example. Door is usually constructed in a way that there are two revel joints, like is, is this case here. And these revel joints are constraining or limiting the same motion possibilities. And for that reason, they are redundant. So they are redundant. So if you think about the door in three-dimensional space, in spatial case, door can move in six different ways. And we know that each one of the revolute joint eliminates five motion possibilities. So this is the first five, and this is the second five. You do the math, and you end up to have minus four degrees of freedom, which is not the case here, because joints, these ones are not independent, but they are dependent. Okay, still more comments about this Chinook competition, which I think that it is very exciting. I'm, I'm too excited. Okay, now I need to find where is my mouse. Where is it now? There, 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 there. Getting, getting closer. All right, so um, that's what we discussed last time. Also, last time we discussed about um, Kinematic analysis, so let me take this a bit more, looking more pretty. Okay, so we discussed about kinematic analysis, and we concluded that the kinematic analysis actually consists of three steps. First one is the most uh, cumbersome one, most difficult one. F fly. How come? All right, so the, the first one, the most cumbersome one is this position level analysis. And it's cumbersome and difficult because you need to use an iterating method to get your position level estimation. You cannot get it that as a, mean, as a means of substitution, but you need to redo the computing as, uh, I mean, as many times as you feel to be comfortable with the accuracy of the results. How are you designing? When is it you are comfortable with the accuracy of the results? Let's get back to that uh, during, after a little, little while. So that's, uh, that's the most cumbersome. Second one is simple. So. Uh, that's the matter of symbol substitution, and that's the velocity level analysis. It's super simple, not complicated at all. And then the final one is uh, acceleration level analysis. That too is a matter of substitution, but this time 
equation that you need to use when you do this substitution is no longer that simple. So that's a little bit of challenge. Doable? Sure, doable, but um, not as pleasant as velocity level analysis. But on the other hand, not so difficult as actually position level analysis. So that's how it goes. Then last time we also concluded that uh, to do this position level analysis, you need to use an iterating method where you're computing something that is called Newton difference. This one here, whole procedure, whole algorithm. Sorry that I'm blocking the view a little bit. So whole algorithm is called Newton Robson analysis, sometimes called Newton iterative uh, solution. So you get the solution such the way that by step by step you get better and better solution. Now you keep on repeating this, uh, updating these uh, coordinates, you can get better and better solution until the difference between the two successive steps becomes to be small. And then you know, okay, now it makes no sense to recompute anymore. So you can be comfortable with the results. Okay. Usually it goes such the way that you can comp compute the length of this delta Q. And as soon as the length is less than predefined um, tolerance, error tolerance, then you can say, okay, now I'm comfortable. I know that we are close enough to final destination. And then you can stop the iterative process. Anyways, so what I was about to tell here is that to compute this Newton difference, which tells you what is the way that you can update your coordinates. What is the direction you need to travel to get the solution? That needs something that is important for us. Now, something that is important for us is this parcel operation, which is parcel C, parcel Q. Remember the C is constraint equations, all right? Parcel Q, it's gonna be Q is generalized coordinates, the one we just discussed. We also discuss about this guy. This is this uh, constraints because we have multiple constraints. Now you can put them in a form of a vector as you can do for generalized coordinates. You have two vectors. So parcel C, parcel Q is actually a matrix. How is that you can compute that matrix? Well, here's the details for you. So it's all about the parcel operation, which I recommend you to, to automize one way or another such that you can use, um, well, symbolic math software, any, any, any kind you want to do this for you, because these are the typical questions that I'm asking in a midterm exam. And once you start doing this by hand, there's a high risk that you can introduce a mistake and that's going to be unpleasant. So make sure you have uh, some kind of um, ready-made, um, algorithm or baits that you can simply substitute the values and then you can get take up your matrix more or less if not automatically you can get it with a reasonable amount of effort okay so that's take up your matrix so take up your matrix is something that you can tell um, now listen to me because the next in class quiz will be related to what i'm just about to say to you Take copy matrix is something that number of rows are equal than the number of constraint equation. And number of columns is equal than generalized coordinates. So this is an information you need when you want to com compute the number or degrees of freedom. Number of degrees of freedom. Because there you need to know how many generalized coordinates minus number of constraint equations. So if you have a skewer take up your matrix, then you know that the number of degrees of freedom is zero. And that's the only information you need to solve the responses. And then there is a question about what is that I recommend to use? What kind of a symbolic math tool? MathCAD is good. I use myself a Maple, but you can use a MATLAB too. MATLAB too, they have this uh, possibility of using a uh, symbolic computing. Yeah, somebody else is supporting me. So, so MATLAB is a good choice. All right, so you know what the take copy of matrix is standing for. So here's my first in class quiz. Dimension of take copy of matrix tells you what? Rotation of a particle. I don't know what to say here. I really don't know what to say here. I just live without comment. So rotation of a particle. 
um, think about it. Color of the body. Nah. Number of degrees of freedom. How gravity force is, is imposed to a body. So those are the choices. And the game is on. I see that I already have uh, 13 answers. So uh, uh, the game is on in terms of uh, how is the success rate today. So how is the success rate today? What do you guys think? My personal guess. Uh, really, Maple has a mobile phone version too. That's a that's a pff, completely new information to me. Okay, so somebody is already voting as a rotation of a particle, but the success rate competition is on, and now uh, we got the numbers that are fairly high. Starting from 82, 93, 89, 98. But what is missing so far is 100%. So my vote is this. Now, there's so many windows open that I'm a bit confused, but uh, my vote is this. Yes, 100%. And here's another one, 100%. There is a three times 100%. That, that, that's my man. Okay, 84 answers, and I have, I can see that I have, uh, excuse me, 64 answers, and I can see that I have 63 views in my stream. So I think that I'm uh, good to close this game. So, this is it. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if you can. If you no, you're not gonna make me angry, but you can make me disappointed. Like seriously disappointed. Like I have no skills whatsoever to teach. Okay, but the results is this. Oh, 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 oh my God! Though this is so close. So we have. We just have a good news. Nothing but the good news. First of all, the first good news is this. No one. Let me, let me repeat. No one is voting rotation of a particle. That's that's outstanding. This is great. This is great. But remember, I'm going to keep this in uh, option from this on. So this is always going to be a, an option. Color of the body got zero votes. Another good news. Number of decrease of freedom, 97% of you got that right. So that's that's awesome number. Gravity of force is incorrect because... How much we have discussed about gravity so far? Zero. We haven't discussed any of the forces so far. We have just discussed about um, kinematics so far, motion so far, how to describe the position, velocity, and acceleration. Nothing whatsoever being mentioned about the forces so far. OK, great news, great news. So we are getting better. So I'm kind of sensing that there is this possibility that we can score 100% in this class. All right, so how to do this uh, kinematic analysis then? All right, so here's um, what I just mentioned about this uh, iterative process. Uh, okay, so there's a, there's another funny story about here in the chat window, which is uh, this rotation of a particle. So this is uh, something that uh, is, uh, for some reason, is a personal thing to me. All right, so we were in this iterative process. So for some reason, I'm blocking the view like seriously, but let me, I'm gonna move in a second, but you could start by first uh, deriving the constraint equation and you compute the J copy of matrix, okay? And then you're gonna compute this um, Newton difference. And with help of Newton difference, and, and again, the way you compute the Newton difference, let me back up a little bit, is the way that you're converting your J copy. And you can only convert it when it is uh, skewer in the size, meaning that they have to, have to have equal number of generalized coordinates and constraint equations. Otherwise, there's no goal. You cannot do it. You just cannot do it. That tells you that the kinematic analysis can be conducted only and only if the number of degrees of freedom is correct, zero. Otherwise, you cannot do it. All right? So then you have here uh, constraint equations. And then this is the way you're updating your coordinates. You're updating your J copy and you're updating your constraint equations. And then you're checking whether or not this is a less than a predefined tolerance. If not, 
you redo the comparing. So now I'm, I guess you see that uh, no means that you're going back here, you redo it. Yes, you're done. You can stop doing it. Okay, so uh, that's it. And uh, my pointer travels where? There. Okay. These, uh, then these other uh, levels, uh, let me just briefly show how it goes. You know, velocity level analysis is fairly straightforward, as mentioned earlier. So uh, basically what you need to do to conduct it, you need to differentiate your constraints once with respect to time. So you need to compute C dot. And again, using same rule of differentiation, details, take a look at the lecture material. So once you conduct this uh, differentiation, you do this uh, using chain rule of differentiation, you can get uh, this equation, which is again, Jacobian matrix multiplied by velocity. And then there's a constraints that are differentiated with respect to time. And now this is equal to zero. So from this equation, you can solve this guy, velocity. And this is how you can compute the velocity. This was already computed in a previous step. So basically you, what you need to do is that you just need to conduct this uh, matrix multiplied by vector, all right? Then when you differentiated this one more time with respect to time, which is gonna get nasty, and it reads like this. So you have here first Jacobian matrix multiplied by acceleration, constraint differentiated twice with respect to time, and then a monster nasty component, which is J copy of matrix, first multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates, that's gonna be a vector. That vector then differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates. And then finally, that, that result, which is a matrix, is multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates. And then some mixed components, which there is a J copy of matrix differentiated with respect to time, multiplied by velocity. No worries, I'm gonna show you how to compute each one of these comp components, so not a, no worries whatsoever. So here's a summary of how to conduct the kinematic analysis. So we, we almost here, so we almost uh, ready to introduce the first numerical example. First, uh, position level analysis, this iterative process, then substitution and velocity level analysis, uh, substitution, that's acceleration analysis. All right. Ready. By the way, no, no, because now there is a high temptation that, or how can I put it, like uh, high assumption that maybe today we're gonna score 100%. And I think that may be the case now because you know you did so well in this first example, this first in class quiz regarding the Jacobian matrix, and next is about to come, so it's almost here. So now put whatever you, other things you're doing, put that in as a little bit aside and focus what I'm about to explain to you. And remember this, kinematic analysis can be conducted if and only if number of degrees of freedom is zero. You have to have equal amount of constraints than generalized coordinates. Otherwise your Jacobian is not skier and that's it. So you cannot proceed from that. Okay, so here's a not complicated mechanism, but the mechanism some kind. So this is a one moving body only, beam-like body that is constrained to ground by using primitive joint here. This primitive joint prevents the motion in a global X direction. Another primitive joint in the here, which uh, not allowing this point to travel in a global Y direction. And then there's a driven constraint, which says that this point here have to travel according to this equation, which is a sine time divided by four minus one divided by two, okay? So let's first create the constraints. And once we have the constraints, then we are ready to go. Okay, so this says that the first step is to create the Jacobian. Yeah, sure. We can keep that as a first step, but uh, you know the, the components we need there is a constraint equation and generalized coordinates. So um, we cannot really have a shortcut here. All right, the first constraint is associated to, or first set of constraints to be more specific, 
is associated to this point here, which is a point A. This point is constrained by two constraint equations. The one that is preventing the motion in a global y direction, and one that is called as a driven constraint, which says that the point have to travel in axial direction using this sign or trigonometric function. Okay. So we defining where the point A is located at, how we can do that. Well, we do know that because this is a business that we know very well. So we're going to use this equation that we are very good at. And meaning that we're going to first, you see how it is? So we get started here in origin of the global coordinate system. We're traveling to origin of the body reference coordinate system with help of vector r, this guy. Then we're taking rotation into account, this guy. And then with, with help of vector u bar, we're going to go to a place where the, the constraints are actually located at, u bar. All right, that then we're setting the constraints, and the constraints are as following. Motion in y direction, zero. Because look at the way that the global coordinate system is located. Motion in x direction. It's going to be based on that driven constraint. OK, driven constraint. And then, uh, so we're here. So then uh, the only kind of difficult thing is to set uh, how is a vector u bar. Take a look at how is a body reference coordinate system. So the x-axis is pointing this direction. So once you're here, your vector u bar have to be minus in a sign because you need to travel the minus x direction. How much? Well, if the full length of the body is L, you need to divide amount that is L divided by two, and that's minus L divided by two to be more specific. How much you need to travel to this direction? You don't need to travel that direction, so that's going to be zero. Now, while substituting this here, this here, then you can get you code you you can get two constraint equations as it is shown here. So that's it. That's your first two constraint equations. There is still one point to go. That is this point P. How we can do that? Redoing, 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 redoing. That's the whole magic of multi-body system dynamics. So uh, let's redo it. So let's uh, use this equation that we know so well. Uh, let's travel to this point where the, the constraint is located at. All right. Not too difficult. So it's the um, only difficult thing, again, is uh, defining what's with the U bar. But this time, not difficult because you know, obviously, you need to go opposite direction versus the, this point. So that's going to be now L divided by 2, positive. Y direction, that's 0. And then this motion have to be set. You know, look at how it is, this uh, this x-axis. So that have to be set to be equal to 0. That's your third constraint equation. And then you're using an awful lot of parcel operation to get what? Jacobian matrix. Your Jacobian matrix is this. Once you do this, all these differential operations, and look at the size, dimensions, to be more specific. So we have three constraint equations, three generalized coordinates, three by three, three by three matrix. That's something that is extremely important to, to understand. Now, because this is three by three, there is at least a theoretical opportunities to invert this. Okay. Skewer means that the number of degrees of freedom is zero. Kinematic analysis can be conducted if the number of degrees of freedom is zero. Here's my next in class quiz. What is the number of degrees of freedom of this system? And here's a hint for you. This is a Jacobian matrix. And um, there. You ready to answer? And the options are: first option, number of degrees of freedom is zero. Second option, number of degrees of freedom is one. Third option that is that the number of degrees of freedom is two. Fourth option is that the number of degrees of freedom is one hundred. And I have no comments. I don't give any comments. I have, I give you no hints, further than you know the, what I just did. Okay.
Okay, and then there is a question like why this constraint point um, A have two constraint this time. So let me go back here and do that explanation again. All right, so I'm already here. Okay, I think that this is the best way to see it. Okay, so this is a combination of this point. I'm speaking about this point A here. Let me change the color to make this more clear. So point A, there is a combination of two different kind of constraints. First of all, there is a constraint that is a primitive joint, which says that this point here have to stay within this slot. So it can slide back and forth, but it cannot do anything else than this sliding. All right, that's the primitive joint. In addition to primitive joint, there is this driven constraint, driven constraint, which is a predefined motion. I'm telling that how this point has to move with respect to time. And because I'm saying, okay, this point cannot move freely x direction, but instead have to follow this predefined motion. This is called driven constraint, predefined motion. And that's an additional constraint. So it have, can be and need to be treated exactly the same way than, uh, than this primitive joint. There is no difference, except that the notation is now different because, uh, you know, this, this driven have this uh, description of predefined motion. That's it. Uh, let me see, was there anything else? And then somebody is saying, oh, now there is so many saying that there's 100%. Which I make me worried, like, guys, there's a chance that you've got this up nose attitude. Like, you you may think that I figure out everything a while ago, at least everything that goes uh, or related to multi-body system dynamics. So, so be careful here, be careful, because, um, yeah, so we'll see how this goes. So my guess is this. No, 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 it's not typing for some reason. Let me, I can use this keyboard. 100. So uh, how many answers? Oh, we have 70 answers, so we are ready to go. So uh, is this it? Is it gonna happen to us? Is it going to happen? This will be a miracle thing. First of all, we're going to go to do this uh, memorable thing that you're never going to forget in your life. This a uh, kinematic analysis. And then plus having the 100% success rate. That will be uh, two outstanding things. But now there is a case what says that is a much lower than that. So, ready. Okay. So, it's very good but not 100%. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, actually I forgot to, to, uh, to write down the winner from the last game, sorry about that. I need to check it out this streaming a bit later to see who was the winner last time. So here's, um, here's the results. Okay. All right, so it's a 91. 91. So it's uh, not as high that I was think that it is. So it's um, it's still okay. So it's very high, but it's uh, it could be higher than that. So let me take you back to the where is it now? Here, uh, back to here. Okay. I know how this this in class quiz is blocking my view. I need to take it off. And uh, now there's a quite a bit of comments yeah, that that you guys are more upset that. Uh, that I am. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So next time, next time, next next time is gonna happen. I have still a plenty of in class quizzes to go today. All right. Dimensions of the Jacobian matrix tells you that number degrees of freedom have to be zero because there are equal number rows and columns. Rows 
are associated to constraint equations. Columns are associated to generalized coordinates. So if there's a skewer matrix, that means that there's number of degrees of freedom is zero. Okay, let me tell you this, because this is going to be my next in-class quiz. So put everything you, other thing you do, put that in aside now for a second. Um, kinematic analysis can be conducted if the number of degrees of freedom is zero. You cannot do it that in any other way. And that's going to, that's uh, what I'm going to explain to you. I mean, that, that's going to be the subject matter of the next in-class quiz. Uh, here. Let's move on. Okay, step number two. So I'm, uh, let me see what time it is. So time is uh, five o'clock. So uh, what I will do is that, uh, I'm gonna at least uh, at least I'm gonna finalize this example and then another example maybe I, I need to think about it because today I'm for some reason I'm a bit tired so I need to see if I need to have a break. Anyways, step number two. Um, okay, so this is a Newton difference for precision analysis. So Newton difference for once, but you need to redo this over and over again. So uh, you do it this in a such the way that you inverse your take option, and that is then multiplied by constraint equation. All right, so, and then you can get the delta. Now I'm plucking the view, but you see that you get, you get the delta, which is not the solution. Not the solution, but it's telling you the direction of where to travel to find the solution. So this is like a navigator, if you may. Navigator tell you where to travel to find the final destination. This is your navigator system here, deltas. All right, step number three, velocity analysis. Again, you know, this is, an, you know, this position level, you need to know that this is an iterated process, so you need to redo that as many times that is necessary. Okay, then um, the next step is a velocity level analysis. Ingredients, components you need are Jacobian matrix, which is then multiplied by constraints that are differentiated with respect to time. This is differentiated with respect to time. This is your constraint equation. It's a little bit of small font, but you can kind of see it. When you differentiate that with respect to time, the only component which says that there is time somehow involved with is the first one. Ah, oh, look at that. So my, yeah, it's coming back. Okay, here's the time. All other components, time is not mentioned, so you can forget about them. But not this one here, because the time is here in this trigonometric function. And once you differentiate that, that's going to be your constraint differentiated with respect to time. This one here is then your velocities. Then the one more step to go, and then we're done. Uh, then I'm going to do the implementation to MATLAB, and then you will see it. So let me see. Yeah, so I was uh, wondering this too. So uh, 74 answering, but only 65 is watching the stream. Yeah, nine people are just guessing. And that's the problem. That's the problem because uh, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Yeah, you should follow what's my stream because otherwise this makes no sense. Good point. And now that I see that the, the slide was moved a little bit to to left. Okay. Here's how you can compute the acceleration. So this is the, you know, others, other components. This is what we already know. This is the inverse of the Jacobian. We need to compute this. We need to compute this. And we need to check whether or not this is a non-zero component too. But let's get started from the middle one, which is a monster. So first, we have Jacobian multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates. All right, this is your Jacobian. This is a velocity of generalized coordinates. Once you multiply them together, you will get the mat, excuse me, vector of two com vector of three components. All right. This vector you will differentiate with respect to generalized coordinates. It's gonna give you a matrix as a result. And this is how the matrix looked like. And that is then finally um, multiplied with uh, with respect, I mean with well, I set up generalized coordinates. So that's going to be your final vector or solution, what you need there. So let's move on. So then there's a couple more components to go. Then uh, this, where you differentiate the 
constraint twice with respect to time. So we already differentiated that once. So that's how it looked like. And then the take copy of matrix, which is this one differentiated with respect to time. But the time is not mentioned here, not explicitly mentioned. So that's going to be a zero vector. So here it is. Here's my MATLAB implementation, which I'm going to place the model side. So, so you don't need to worry about that. And more about MATLAB implementation. I'm not going to explain this in details because maybe you are not that much interested about the MATLAB details. But what I will do you instead is that I'm going to run this analysis. I know I just need to find it out like where uh, all my windows. So maybe I need to clear up a little bit. You know, that's the best way to go. So let me take down pretty many material. What happened to my OBS? No, it's healthy. It's good. Oh, okay, okay. That but just disappeared. And I want to show you this. Now let's see how well it goes. I think that I need to better. The easiest way to go is that I just uh, add the display capture. And this is my display. Okay. I disappeared. Yeah, I disappeared completely, but that's okay. That's uh, You don't miss much if you don't see my face. Okay, so I have here my implementation. So if you want to take a look, this will be available in the model side. So I, I implemented everything. I made this iterated process and everything. So um, so let me run this this system. All right. So uh, that was my solution, and you see this is a uh, animation. Hopefully, oh my God, this is a little bit uh, unpleasant because it disappears. So I need to put it here. So this is my animation. You see this? What do you say about that? Is, is that an emotional moment? So we saw the kinematic response of that cam or this one body system, this beam-like body, such that this was constrained by, oh, you don't see my, my picture now, so I need to somehow put my camera in the front. Is it now come, come into front? No, not yet. So let me hide this and let me take myself back. So we saw the, the system where this was a, there's a primitive join in this end, uh, there was a primitive join in another end, and there was a driven constraint that was pre-described motion. And we were able to do it. We were able to do it. You may think, okay, how come is it such the big deal that you can see the one body moving like a ridiculous way? Of course, this is not the big deal, this one body, but this approach, we just went through. You can apply to any mechanism you want, and still you can solve the kinematic analysis. And that's exactly the beauty of multi-body system dynamics. So it's not case dependent, not depending on how big is your brain, but you just follow the certain steps and you automatically are capable to solve the responses. Okay, so and it wasn't, of course, not just as uh, animation, but, you know, what we can do is that we can have a, if we take myself back to this one, of course, now you can uh, make a plottings about different quantities, like uh, angular uh, acceleration, velocities, angular velocities, and all the, all the generalized coordinates in a position and uh, velocity and ang uh, acceleration level can be now solved. So here's angular acceleration, angular velocity, orientation of local coordinate system, R, X position. So these are just an examples that shows that, okay, you can, you can compute all that. So that's what I wanted to say. All right, here comes my next in-class quiz. Kinematic analysis can be carried out if you know what. 
if you know shape of the bodies that this is this is the only information you need nothing else so if you know the shape of the bodies can you conduct a kinematic analysis yes or no if you know moments imposed to the system then can you conduct a kinematic analysis yes or no if you know force is imposed to the system can you conduct a kinematic analysis yes or no or if you know the constraint of the system can you then conduct a kinematic analysis yes or no and the game is on. Game is not yet on because I, I lost my browser. It's here. And I got uh, zero answers uh, this time, but now the answers are coming. So tell me, what's the necessary information that you can conduct the kinematic analysis? Only information, actually. What is it? And then I take myself back to the comments. Okay, so the stream numbers are not always correct, really. Okay. Okay. Yeah, game is on. Game is on. Okay, now you guys uh, lost your self-confidence, I can see that, because uh, it's only two of you that are voting 100%. Oh, now it's uh, three of you that are voting 100%. The rest are thinking that, no, this is never going to fly. We're never going to have a 100% success rate. It's not going to happen for us. It will happen. It will happen. I can guarantee you that. When it's going to happen? That I don't know. But eventually it will. By the way, while we are here and uh, while we are having a kind of a break a little bit, you know, one uh, hint to you is that in the YouTube, I um, recommend you to put the um, uh, closed capturing on. I, th I think that really helps because the, the kind of the problem is that, you know, of course, I'm not a native speaker and because I'm not the native speaker, it may be um, a little hard to understand uh, what I wanted to say because, you know, the English may not be as smooth as uh, it could be. But it, for some reason, the YouTube is so clever that it can understand my English well. And if you put the subtitles on or closed capturing on, you know, it's uh, with practically no mistakes. Everything is correct. You know, every, you know, certain things like parcel operation may not be correctly spelled, but other than that, everything is correct. Okay, so uh, we are here. Where is the window itself? Oh, not that, but uh, this one. Okay, we got 73 answers. I think this is pretty much it. So uh, like mentioned earlier, the stream, we, uh, at least I can see that there are stream views is 60 this time so uh 13 additional students are giving the answers so information you need to know is this look at that look at that so it's it's always so close so close but not exactly so um it's of course constraint of the system Forces. We have not mentioned a single word about the forces. I mean, maybe I have mentioned a single word about the forces, but we haven't really discussed those in details. So that's already a hint to you that it cannot be the correct answer. Moments. I don't think I have ever mentioned a moment before. Shapes of the body. Yeah. Well, that's irrelevant information. That's not going to help you to conduct the kinematic analysis. So you need to know the constraints. And only the constraints, because the constraint is a solution for a kinematic analysis. All right. So here's another example for you. And uh, before that, let me hide this one. And hmm. There. All right. So here's another example. So this is a crankshaft mechanism or mechanism that is consisting of two moving bodies, beam-like bodies, both. And uh, here I have, first of all, 
revolute joint that connects the first beam-like body to ground. Then there's a revolute joint that connects the two beam-like bodies together. Then there is, a, again, combination of primitive joint plus driven constraint. Primitive joint plus driven constraint. Primitive joint is not allowing this point to move in a global Y direction. Primitive joint is saying that this point have to follow the predefined motion, which is again provided here. Uh, this looked like pretty much the same that we discussed last time. So it's a sine 2 multiplied by time divided by 4 plus 1. So that's your constraints. We have two moving bodies. So it's every if everybody needs three generalized coordinates, that means that there is a total of six generalized coordinates in this system. And then uh, because of the two revel joints, there's going to be two multiplied by two constraints associated with that. And then uh, plus one primitive joint plus one driven constraint, that's going to be six. So the number of degrees of freedom is zero. Great. So now we have good chances to conduct the kinematic analysis. Uh, and I need to take a, clear my windows a little bit. There. Okay, all right. So uh, let's get started by first setting these constraints. Uh, once we have the constraint, rest is mechanical, mechanical, where the no thinking is needed. Now this time, um, I'm gonna take a use of, um, I'll make a use of the previously defined constraints. You remember a um, week ago, two weeks ago, no, a week ago, we derived the constraints for the same system where we concluded at the time this driven constraint were missing, or driven constraint was missing to be correct. And now uh, I'm going to get this first, first five constraints from the previous week. So this is how they read. So I'm not going to re repeat it. But this driven constraint needs a little bit of attention because this is going to be introduced the same way we did it in a previous case. So we're going to introduce the, we're going to constrain the motion in the global x direction to be defined, predefined. All right. And now I can see that my slides again, for some reason, is switched to the left. Let it be like that for a little while. Okay, so this is going to be my sixth constraint equation, which is a function of time. So these are the five first constraint equations. This is my sixth. What is a vector of generalized coordinates? Well, that's going to be, of course, uh, you know, generalized coordinates associated with the first body, Rx, Ry, and angle theta. And the generalized coordinates associated to the second body, R, X, R, Y, and theta. And now when you do the, when you're comparing the Jacobian matrix, that's going to be all just parcel operation. Parcel C, parcel Q. That's it. That's all you need to know. And uh, now it's again, it's looking promising because it's a skewer in a shape. So uh, you are probably able to convert it. And then, uh, you know, this time, let me see. So it's not showing how is oh is I I think that I missed the one slide here because the next step should be to computing the the Newton difference that is obviously missing. Step number three velocity analysis. So again I have here ingredients that are Jacobian matrix constraint differentiated with respect to time. Only constraint that is a function of explicit function of time is this one here. So when you diff once you differentiate it, that with respect to time, that's what you're gonna get. Here is your velocity analysis, which is a matter of substitution. And then uh, this painful thing about the acceleration, first is a monster component, first Jacobian multiplied by velocities. That is then, that's gonna give you a vector of six components. That is then differentiated with respect to generalized coordinates. And once you do that, then you're going to get again six by six matrix, which is uh, then multiplied by velocity of generalized coordinates. You're going to get the six, a vector of six components. And then the final one is that you differentiated the CT one more time with respect to time. And this again is a zero because J copy and was not the explicit function of time. That's it. That's it. Let me see if I can run this second uh, mechanism for you. So again, it's going to be pretty much same story than uh, the last time. 
Oh, I need to share my screen with you. So hold on. Let me make this a bit bigger. So this is my MATLAB code. Not yet here. Okay, this is now my MATLAB code. I'm gonna run it. Okay. So again, the same procedure, and uh, again, this uh, this MATLAB this MATLAB code too, which is a awful ugly coding. So those of you that are very good in the coding, don't take a look at the details because uh, this is not a good looking thing. And here it is. Let's first take a look at the animation and then we can take a look at the other results too. So the important thing is, the important observation is that we did nothing differently in this case. So again, the same thing. And again, you may wonder like, really? Is this worth to do it? Well, it is a part of the, the business. Part of the business is a kinematic analysis. So now we're conducting this kinematic analysis by using the knowledge we gained already. So this is how it's moving. So it's looking uh, a little bit childish, I admit that. But uh, again, the bigger picture is fantastic behind. And again, you know, I have these uh, different coordinates that I'm plotting here. So I'm uh, looking is in a position, velocity, and acceleration level. All that is possible. And everything comes more or less automatically. So. What do you say? Was that a big moment in your life? Okay. All right. Okay. So I mean that uh, because you do have a little enough privacy, it's okay to cry because of this high emotion due to this new knowledge you just gained. So that's a uh, kinematic analysis. Only the, what is, is only the half of the figures on, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you know, I obviously put the, you know, my sc screens sharing wasn't correct. But anyway, so this MATLAB code will be available in uh, Moodle site so you can run it by yourself. Sorry about that. I was not looking at my OBS and I don't have my, my phone open today. So my mistake, apologizing that. Yeah, my desktop needs some serious cleaning. Yeah, I clean that uh, every now and then, but that doesn't really help much. Not helping that much. Okay. Um, then, example where a kinematic analysis is being used. Okay, so um, this is a bicycle model. And the bicycle model is one of those models that you can uh, describe using a multi-body system dynamics. And a while ago, there was a group in uh, Netherlands, in Delft University of Technology, that were uh, specialized, they're still specialized to bicycle dynamics. But they wanted to figure out, like, what is a uh, magic behind the bicycle? How is it you can... Um, what is, that? what is the reason that the bicycle is self-stable? You know, that is self-stable and uh, uh, what makes that to be self-stable? And they've been um, different kind of impasse, there were different kind of explanation why it is self-stable. And those explanations include gyroscopic forces, um, then um, there's a steering um, geometry and so on and so forth. So uh, those are the explanations. And these, these guys, we can wanted to figure out like what exactly makes it to be stable. The answer, it wasn't that great because it's actually a combination of parameters that makes it stable. So it, it wasn't easy to answer that simple question. So the answer is actually very complicated. But um, then uh, we too here in LUT University wanted to, to do something regarding the bicycle. Uh, we made a bicycle, which is, uh, you can see that this is a, uh, uh, built a bicycle that was instrumented by tree sensors and tree, uh, tree sensors because um, bicycle model consists of uh, three degrees of freedom 
And these three degrees of freedom are forward velocity, lean angle, and steering angle. And once you know these uh, degrees of freedom, then you know how is the configuration of your bicycle. So we did this an experiment that we measure those uh, quantities. And once we know those quantities, then we can kind of use those as a driven constraint in our bicycle model. And that's something that is an example about what is that the, you can do with this, the skills you've just learned. With a little bit of extra knowledge, I think, or a little, little, let's say a little bit of extra effort, let's put it this way. And now uh, once you're capable to do it, then, uh, then you can visualize your bicycle as it is shown here, so you can see how it goes. But you can go beyond of that, so you can easily start estimating the quantities that are not no longer directly measured, but the, but computationally estimated, and those include forces too. So this is where it becomes to be really practical. Okay, so uh, there's uh, so many um, comments that is a uh, it's a little hard to follow all that. Okay, I, I'm not going to pay too much attention to that. And now I'm going to switch to this uh, forest estimation. So that's what's going to happen here. All right. So with that, I will move on. So now we're going to leave this kinematic analysis. And we're going to open a new, completely new thing. Completely new thing. Because from this on, it was all about kinematics. All about position, velocity, and accelerations and constraint. How is that you can define those uh, the three quantities, position, velocity, and acceleration? So far, there were nothing whatsoever to discuss about forces. And what will follow or what's going to be happening from this, this direction, so this on, is going to be all, the, all about the forces. So now we're going to start looking about how is it one can describe the equation of motion. Equation of motion, which theoretically can be expressed like this. Mass multiplied by acceleration is equal to external applied forces. Now, our challenge here, which I'm going to tell you right away, is to express these uh, quantities. This is inertia forces. This is uh, external applied forces. Such the way that they are a function of generalized coordinates. As this is expressed here, is actually a function of global coordinates. How can I know that? I know it because R is this equation, which is a you know a final product of this equation is this vector R. Vector R consists of two components that are position in with respect to global x and y direction. So this is telling you that this is ex this expression is already in a global coordinate system. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that because I want to use a global, excuse me, generalized coordinates to express my forces. Because generalized coordinates are the ones that are telling me that how is the configuration of the system at any given time. So my challenge is this, how to convert these forces to be expressed by using generalized coordinates. That's what I would like to do. And now let me take a look. So it's um, we'll have a, roughly a 15 minutes left today. Mm, okay, maybe we can just continue without having any breaks. How that sounds? How would you like to have a break today? How is your feelings? I need to get more coffee. For some reason, is um. It's been a long day today. But uh, my question was that would you like to have a break or you just go ahead and explain this uh, remaining 50 minutes or so? I see no comments yet. So am I still online? I hope that I am. No breaks, full speed. All right, so no breaks then. So you got the you got the challenge, or you got the like a big picture of what I would like to do here. So 
expressing force is in terms of tenorized coordinates. That's what I would like to do. Uh, that's where this concept of virtual work and virtual displacement comes into play. And they really helps us to kind of introduce this mapping between the global coordinates and tenorized coordinates. And that's exactly what we need. So we need to have this mapping. So that's critical. All right. And we're going to spend a little bit of time today or this reminding time to give you an idea about what is this concept about virtual displacement, virtual work. This whole story about virtual displacement and virtual work is something that I'm sure you have heard that number of times already, already in your past solar level studies. And you may think that it is something, that it's a concept that is easy to use and um, it's actually not that easy to use. My recommendation to you to, you know, kind of the, the mindset I would like you to have to understand the concept of virtual displacement and virtual work is that it's a mathematical tool. Don't put too much effort to try to make a physical interpretation how the virtual displacement look like, because it's going to be painful. But think about it more like a mapping tool, mapping tool that is converting something from one coordinate system to be expressed in another coordinate system. Now what we wanted to do is we want to find a relation between these global coordinates and generalized coordinates. And that's exactly where the virtual displacement or virtual work to be more specific comes into play. And we'll do the job for us. This is where you need it. But don't start to think about, okay, how small is a virtual displacement and what is its direction and so on and so forth. That's going to make your mind, that's going to make you be confused. So let's just keep it simple. Let's look at the mathematics. Mathematics this time is our friend. Usually it's something that I, we really don't care about the details, but this time we do. We do because it's telling us this mapping that we desperately need. Okay, here's... Uh, so what does this say? Keep going. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, here's our setup here. This is where we need to start our discussion. So I have here a potato-shaped body. I think this is exactly the same body we looked at the previous time when we were defining where the particle is located with respect to global coordinate system. The body is called A. And now this time there is a force applying in the one specific location of this potato say body. And the lo location where the force is applying can be expressed by using the equation that we know very well. We know back and forth this equation. This is an equation that you're first traveling the body reference coordinate system, which is not visible here, accounted by this vector here. And then you're taking the orientation of the body reference coordinate system into account. And with help of the vector U bar, you're traveling exactly the location where the force is applying, all right? Now this force is applying in this particular point. Force is having two components, which are F, X, and F, Y. These are the components with respect to global coordinate system. How you know that? Well, you know it because you look at the number of coordinate or number of components you have here. You have two components, two components. And this is in a line of, oh, okay, so hold on, my, my power, but won't we'll be back momentarily. Okay, so these are in a line of this global X and Y coordinate axis. So this is obviously global coordinate system. Now, what you wanted to do instead is that you would like to express this force, the same force, but using another set of coordinates. Which one? This one, of course, this generalized coordinates, because this is what we wanted to solve. Remember what we did in the kinematic analysis. We were only focusing on Tenorized coordinates. Why? Because they are telling us what is the configuration of the system. Same holes in dynamics. So we need to know these coordinates. And once we know these coordinates, then we're safe. Then we're safe. And then uh, that's it. But to do that, first, every single force, which is, we only have two different kind of forces, external applied forces and inertia forces. Both need to be expressed in terms of Generalized coordinates. That's what we wanted to do. All right, so how this goes? Well, this mapping, converting force 
from global coordinates to generalized coordinates. We can make that happen with help of virtual displacement and virtual work to be more specific. But uh, here are some guidelines due to virtual work and the virtual displacement. Um, virtual work, first of all, is something that, uh, no, uh, the virtual work is kind of like a real work. Huge difference is the fact that in the virtual work, time is assumed to be not running. And this is like, what? You do that in, 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 a, in a moment that there, the time is not moving. Yes, that's what we're doing. But again, think about this as a mathematical thing. And soon I'm going to make a comparison between the real work and virtual work. And this is uh, when things becomes to be clear to you. But, um, you know, this is a... Where, is, where the heck is my pointer? All right. Here's my pointer. So... Uh, Concept of virtual work and virtual displacement. We need them to, to create the equation of motion and more specifically to create this mapping between the global coordinates and generalized coordinates. Now, uh, how are we going to do this? So let's make a look. Let's take a look at an example. So in this example, I have a different shape of the body, but concept is still the same. So this time I have a beam-like body and the force is applying in the beam-like body here. And, um, you know, what I wanted to do is that I wanted to, to first compute the, um, you know, this force, where the force is applying. And then once I'm using the concept of virtual work, then the, this displacement, which um, is shown here, I'm going to introduce this virtual operator for that. And this virtual operator is going to introduce this magic mapping. I'm not sure how to explain that in a good way, but, you know, I think that I'm talking too much and showing too little. I think so. So let me see. So, um, so is there like um, singularity? So, um, not really. Uh, let me, let me try to explain this. Um, let me, let me try to explain this in a more concrete way. And I think the easiest to make it happen is that we're going to take a look at the next example here. This example that I'm about to introduce you. Okay. All right, here's the setup. So I have the, here's this beam-like body, and then there's a beam-like body where the force is applying in a position or a particle O. We can call that a position of, of O or particle O. This point where the force is applying can be expressed as it is shown here. And now when we're multiplying the force and the displacement, that's going to be our uh, work. Because uh, force multiplied by displacement in the direction of the force, that by definition is our work. And that's what we're going to use here. This is going to be our magic mapping tool that we're going to use momentarily. To make this clear to you, let's try to first look at how is uh, this... Uh, relationship between the real work and the virtual work. And let's take a look at that first, how is, uh, you know, the real work. You know, we have here force multiplied by displacement. And, then, and look at what I, how I do this. So I have here, you know, the, where, where the force, excuse me, where the point is originally located at, and where it is moved because of the force. So this vector is in the direction of force. This displacement, which is divided, mentioned as a delta R, is multiplied by a force. That's what I just said. I say that the force, by the definition, is a displacement in the direction of force. This is it. So this is mathematical or kind of like multi-body way to say that. Now, so here's the real work. So how you can compute this delta R, this is where the mathematics comes into play. And once you're using your mathematic operation, mathematic skills to be more specific, then you can express this delta R to be such the way that is partial R partial T, T is the time here, multiplied by delta T, because now this is a real work, and the time is running. And then there's a partial R partial Q multiplied by delta Q. All right. In virtual work, time is not running. There is no delta T here. How you do that in the real life? Well, you don't. But this is just a mathematical tool to introduce this mapping for us. So this guy here will be removed 
one you're using or when you're using this concept of virtual work. So in virtual work, so what we're going to do is that we're going to have this, uh, uh, this definition. So we have virtual work, which is uh, this delta work. It's going to be virtual, like minor, really minor, minor, small displacement multiplied by forces. And now because the time is not running, I can replace this delta by this, this other operation. And because this one here is disappearing, you know, this is what is left. And I'm sure this sounds like a nightmare. Remember what I said? I think that I said this in the very beginning. I said that um, this course is a course that the, the level of difficulty is progressively increasing. So we can start with the easy, small things, and then soon things becomes to be more and more complicated, in increasingly complicated. And I said that we have this mountain that we have to climb up. We're close to that mountain. So we are not, uh, we are having this very complicated concept that are not easy to get a hold on it, or get a grip on it. So this is difficult and I have to admit, but that's okay. Let's take it easy. Let's just walk together and this is going to be okay. I'm going to explain every single details to you such the way that there will be no big surprises to you but I need your help and I need you to follow my lectures, my streaming recordings or read my hands out, whatever. But you cannot, this is an information that, that you cannot figure it out in any other sources than, than in my lectures. I mean, you can, but it's going to be explained in such a complicated way ways that you will be messed. Okay. Yeah, you need to take a look at this again, but don't don't look at this too many times. This uh, because we're gonna repeat this over and over again. But I was just telling you that this is this is a complicated thing. This is a complicated thing. All right. No. <laughs> yeah, you need. Yeah, yeah, you need. You need to. Uh, there's a there's an outstanding comment. I like this uh, Elvis comment a lot, because uh, yes. You need to have this can-do attitude. You need to have this uh, high self-confident, high self-confident that you can make it happen. For sure, you can make this happen. This is a no problem, definitely no problem. But this is not easy. I admit that. Whole concept the virtual work and virtual displacement is like really. What is a counterpart in real life? And there is no real counterpart because this is more mathematics. All right, all right. So. Let's take a look. Here's my virtual work done by this guy here, this force here. Uh, this is, um, you know, again, like real work, this is dot product of work and displacement. But difference to real life is, and to me, real work is the fact that when I'm computing this delta R here, the time is not assumed to be running. So the delta T will disappear. Now that simplifies things, even though that it beginning may sound like no way, this cannot simplify it, anything at all. All right, but when I'm using the information from the previous slide, I can express this delta R such the way that it's a delta, excuse me, parcel R, parcel Q multiplied by delta Q. All right, so this is um, something that, Sounds like very involving, very cumbersome mathematics. And it is that. But there is something that is extremely important for us. And this is exactly this guy here. The one in the middle here. You know, take a look what this says. This says parcel R, parcel Q. What this is doing for us. This is actually a matrix which is having two rows, three columns. And this is this matrix matrix that is converting expression from a global coordinate system to be expressed in terms of generalized coordinates. That's exactly what I wanted to have in the very beginning. So I'm in the right track. So obviously this is where the truth can be found. And now I can see that it's a pretty much time to stop today. So that's what's gonna happen. This mapping is something that is very important for us. And it allows us to express the equation of motion using generalized coordinates, which I will get back to that topic next week. And we're going to take a look at the details of that mapping matrix. 
which we are not going to do today. We're going to take a look at the big picture like showing on here. And then we're going to take a look at, um, you know, how we can convert force to be expressed in terms of generalized coordinates and what's the role of this mapping matrix. So mapping matrix that converts expression or relates global coordinates and generalized coordinates. That's what it is. But with that, gonna close for the day. So I'm gonna, yeah, I know that there's a two minutes left or one minute left, but um, like I said, today I'm feeling a bit tired. So I'm gonna close for today and I will get back to this thing next week, Wednesday with some more thorough explanation and not thorough explanation about mathematics, but what it means for us. Why we do this thing? Why are we making ourselves, our life difficult with this parcel operation? So why, why we do this whole thing? That I will explain to you next week, Wednesday. So with that, I'm going to close the streaming and I'm going to close the recording and um, see you in a couple of minutes in a team session. And before the team session, I need to, uh, to visit in the restrooms. I will be in a team session two minutes from now. So trust me, this is going to be okay. This is going to be okay, even though that you, I'm sure you will be first having this, you know, laughing and having this happy feeling because of the kinematic analysis. And now you're in a shock because of everything is so complicated because of this virtual displacement and virtual work. It's all going to turn out to be a good thing. No worries. All right. Take it easy and uh, see you in a uh, couple of minutes in a team session. Uh, where is my pointer? Yeah.